we were just talking about your other musical taste, if we can just go back over that. Um, as well as serious, as well as being taken to Parsifal and things like this, um, you learnt to enjoy Gilbert and Sullivan, is that right? Very much. All, all the Gilbert and Sullivan, yes, yeah, yes, even the, the saucer or whatever it is. Mm. And, uh, Radigore. Uh, trial mm. by jury, was there, I think? Yeah, mm. Radigore, certainly. Mm. Mm. What did, I mean, was it the music, was it the words, or was it a combination that... Uh, oh, it's all a combination, mm. isn't it? Mm. Gilbert and Sullivan, it's a unity. Mm. I think I didn't appreciate how witty Gilbert was when I was thirteen. Mm. You don't, you don't understand that at mm. all, I think, do you? No. But um, gradually the um, prose turned mm. into poetry, or turned mm. into mm. <laughs> which Sullivan did mm. so wonderfully well with. Mm. Well, yeah. today, on the 29th of February, is a very appropriate day to remember, because that's the. the theme on which Birthday, the, yes, the, the um, yes, Pirates right. of Penzance hinges. Yes, yes. <laughs> Lovely. I was going to ask you, uh, um, now we've reached Selwyn College, um, some people have argued that the considerable productiveness and creativity of many people who have been in Oxford and Cambridge is related to the college system um, and the way in which people of different disciplines interact there. Do you think that is an important Factor. I don't know. Um, you see, I've, it's my only experience of life, really. Mm. I mean, I have never been in another university context uh, but Cambridge, uh, except, except for just the year I got at customs, who can't go at all. Of course, I, I did do a sabbatical year and eventually did, having been given this money before the war to go to Germany, I felt I had to go to Germany at some point. And um, so I did do a ter term at Göttingen and a term at Tübingen. Mm. And I, um, later on I did a term at um, the Canberra ANU. Mm. But my own, my whole conception of university is Cambridge. I'm mm. very narrow. narrow. Have, but have you found being in a college where, um, if you have a problem which overlaps into other disciplines? Oh yes. It's, it's but uh, well, it's the faculty too. Mm. I mean, uh, uh, you'll get great help. But it, the difference have got to be too wide. I mean, I, you know, I never get much help that I know of from an engineer or something, <laughs> although I respect them hugely. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think it's good all the same, but then, as I say, I have no, no, no experience mm. of anything else. I mean, the mention of engineers, were there, were there any people in other disciplines who maybe you didn't get help from but you came to came to be friends and influence uh, you liked very much and respected very much Any yes stuff? yes I think I think there were um, several mm. probably we were very happy at college and um, s several of them became great friends mm. um, a medical called Edward Ford who um, what was his name Edward Ford, mm. he was an anatomist by origin, I think. Mm. He was a lovely man, and um, David Harrison, who was, 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 was master, not immediately, but after one, uh, master of Selwyn. After, he was a chemical engineer, and um, a, gl a glorious engineer called Robin Jackson, who terribly sadly died, at, I don't know, I was going to say late, f middle fifties, something like that, mm. an office sad, but lovely, lovely man. And why, they were all wise, wise heads. Um, but I'm not quite, uh, I'm not quite confident enough 
because of my ignorance, to know whether um, the Germans say how mad you are to put everybody in different disciplines into one mm. college. And why don't you have a college which is full of historians mm. and let them mm. get on with it? Mm. Um, I'm not prepared to say that's impossible. I just prefer <laughs> what I used to. Mm. <laughs> Did you find, I mean, micropolitics of Cambridge, like anywhere else, is quite difficult. And running a college is notoriously difficult because you don't have many sanctions um, and not many gifts to offer either. So it's done by diplomacy and charisma. Did you find it a difficult job? Um. I think I did it first, because I was the youngest of the fellows, so to speak, mm. when I arrived. And um, they were very humane and tolerant. Um, I I was much more bored with committees of the history faculty than the committees of the college. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't be bored with the history of the college, the committees of the college too, especially if they were finance or... Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, Have you any advice to the aspiring young master of a college in the Cornford tradition? Or <laughs> no, no, certainly not. <laughs> the circumstances are probably wholly different now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Simultaneously, you, you'd become Dixie Professor of mm. Ecclesiastical History, and it's probably a, be an interesting thing just to have uh, a short discussion about your views about history. Um, one of the things that interested me in reading about your work was that you seem to be caught in a dilemma between moralizing and not moralizing. I mean, that you feel that morality is a central feature of human beings and therefore we have to and we are moral yeah, I creatures. Get too, probably get too much morality in there. No. Well, I've just written a, a, th a thing about Charlotte Corday and um, it partly, <laughs> partly merged into the uh, tyrannicide the whole theory of tyrannicide, mm. so that I'm starting comparing um, the, the executions of Charles I or Louis XVI mm. with um, Stauffenberg mm. and 1944 or um, <coughs> other famous tyrannicides. Uh, that, that's morality. I mean, uh, mm. the, the times in which it's maybe better to murder somebody mm. than not. <laughs> mm. You think there are occasions? Well, I think the whole thing about the um, the Catholic Church has laid laid down occasions mm. in its canons, and um, I think that the whole business of Hitler. Nazis made it obs made all that stuff obsolete, really. Um, well, I say all this you see in Corday, right? and, mm. and uh, perhaps you think that's moralizing, bringing too much morality into history. Why has it made it obsolete? You mean it, it's no longer even worth discussing whether? Well, no, I think it. I think it. I think circumstances could arise. Mm where it's worth discussing, you normally um, the view is of course that um, an individual who takes it to himself that the only time it's right to kill a ruler is if the magistrates decide and uh, hence the some people will justify the execution of Charles I, and some people will justify the execution of Louis XVI. Mm. Though the magistrates in both cases were just a wee bit dubious. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But you would extend it beyond that, I mean, in the case of Hitler, obviously. 
case of in the case of Hitler or Pol Pot or Stalin. Yes, yes. Th there comes a point where, um, I mean, one of the rules is that th th it must be certain that the situation after the murder mm. is better than the situation before. Mm. And how you know it's certain is, of course, we have to. And um, I mean, uh, they murdered Heydrich mm. with English help. The Czechs murdered mm. Heydrich. Mm. Well. Um, Heydrich, if everybody ever deserved being murdered, Heydrich was then. Mm. But the result was, of course, the killing of lots of Czechs. Mm. So the question is, is the situation mm. really worse or better mm. um, than that? Um, well, with Louis the Sixteenth, it was difficult to predict what would, what was, was the out outcome. Mm. Yes, it was difficult. Mm. Yes, yes. But that, I mean, becomes a political necessity that if um, if Mussolini hadn't been murdered by hmm. uh, patriots, by hmm. uh, guerrillas, um, and we had to put him on trial, you'd have had a marvelous propagandist time, rather like Milosevic hmm. did. Yes. Hmm. Um, so that from the point of view of uh, the situation being better generally, it was much better that he hmm. should be murdered by somebody, hmm. <laughs> which did crudely. Hmm. <laughs> You've written a book on Acton. Yes, um, I read Acton very much. Of course, um, I had his library in the university library, a great library. If we're all, I mean, if you're mm. a church historian, mm. it was Acton's love. Mm. He never published anything more than a few articles on it, yeah. but it was his love. Mm. And he collected a magnet, he bought steadily the 19th century, when people were having revolutions, uh, that Spain was um, selling its monastic books, Portugal was selling its monastic books, sometimes Italy was selling its monastic, the suppressing monasteries mm. everywhere through Europe, and all the, the and some masses of these books are in our library. I mean, it's wonderful. In and the, so. In, yeah, in the university library. In mm. our university mm. library. Mm. Mm. So that. Um, you couldn't be, help but be in love with Acton if you were foss if he was fostering your own information, mm. your own discovery, or your own diminution of your ignorance. I mean, there are many reasons to love him. One was his erudition, as you say, and his library and his mm. wealth. Of mm. another is his the theme of his life's work, which is liberty and, and right. the conditions of liberty. Yes. Was it the combination of these things? All these things mattered to me, I think, mm. yes. Yes, they did. Um, but again, he's the, the doubt, of course, in this is whether the morality took over sometimes from the mm. history. Or was allowed to be too prominent. Mm. So I think, after all, there he is. Yes, that's the picture. How well I'll try and get that later. Um, and then there's the question of whether the learning overwhelmed, I mean the famous question of whether the learning overwhelmed the, um, the, the writer. I was looking at his famous slips recently in the UL for the first time and you could see that you could do nothing with them. They were, they were just... No, no. Nobody could, nobody slips through to anybody, anybody else really, are they? <laughs> I think. Well, except I put all mine on the internet, and they're usable. Um, uh, but they it requires a further stage, which he never did, which is um, to have some kind of heading. That these are just sort of wonderful sources. Yeah, yeah. But um, I looked at the, the slip packets, and they're not organised in any way, and there's no heading. Yeah. So if he wanted to find everything, I mean, Fraser had a method like this, J. G. Mm. Fraser. But he uh, had a heading like, you know, magical hair, and then all the slips under magical hair would go there. Keith Thomas, whose method I've observed, has the same thing. You know, the slips under magic or whatever go in one place. And the, but as far as I could see, um, Actons were just in the first stage. He then had to go through them again and order them in some way. There was some kind of order, isn't there? 
Um, gosh, got the wrong thing. Greeting you, Shakespeare. Oh, the action papers. I think it may be the order of the sources or very broad categorization. But the, the ones I looked at were from one or two particular mm. authorities. Mm. But um, mm. the, the subject indexing, which is what you have to do. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. And so one just wonders whether. I mean, there were were the plans, of course. Just just leave it on the <coughs> the the plans to write the vast history of liberty or the, the Cambridge history. Um, I was reading Maitland's piece on on Acton, um, mm. and the, the plan was there, and then he died, and you know never got executed. Mm. Um, from your from your study of him, are there any other reasons why you think he produced so little, wrote so little? Well, I think I think um, I've known other people in my life who were immensely loved and never produced anything. Mm. Uh, they 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 were so much in love with diminishing their ignorance mm. uh, that they never actually communicated to the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my namesake, K.B. McFarlane, was famous for one article on Bastard. Yes, 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 that's right. And that little book on Wycliffe. So, <laughs> so it was often a joke about Cambridge medieval historians, you know, that they mm. wrote very little. Um, if you were to, I mean, this is a difficult question, rather naive one, but if you were to characterize your own historical approach um, mm. and give advice to a young historian, how would you... Oh, I, I think I'd refrain from giving advice. Oh, well, how would you describe? Kind. <laughs> <laughs> how would you describe? I mean, are you a positivist? Do you start with the the documents and then? Yes, yes, I think so. Yes, yes. Um, I don't like too much theory. I don't like um, Toynbee at all, hmm. and that's not because. Um, he was a particular age uh, in history. It's just that the whole notion behind it, it seems to me fallacious. Um, um, I admit that I, and uh, like everybody else, has strong prejudices or something, but I don't know what they are, mm. so I don't, just don't worry about them. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Some people, as you know, think that history is a fascinating tale of um, random accidents and that there are no patterns or mm. whatever, and Toynbee was one of those who thought he could see the patterns, and there have been others. Others say that there is no point in studying something if it has no patterns or meaning and you can't learn anything from it. Um, what? Where do you... You must have thought I, about I think that's a, a, a good warning, but rather than but not quite true. That um, I wouldn't quite know whether. You see, Butterfield tried to prove, didn't he, that politicians who know no history must be worse politicians than those who do know history. Mm. And I suspect that might be that the Balkans might be better off at the moment if mm. uh, one of the people like David Owen or Lord Ashdown had mm. known some history. Mm. Um, but, um, and I do think that um, understanding anything needs a, needs a history to it, that uh, it's not an isolated fact. No fact mm. is isolated, is it, really? Mm. Always has explanations, no doubt some of them are wrong. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but how does it help, if, unless there are some patterns, there's some recurrence in the... Yes, yeah. Um, there are there are, there are patterns, um, obviously. 
um, anything like democracy hmm. um, or dictatorship or oratory. Hmm. Um, and I think the historian just thinks that he's dealing in individual facts and they are individual facts. Um, he's not doing history. He's writing, isn't he? He's writing who's who or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How far, I mean, your, most of your work has concentrated on the history of the Christian Church and the Reformation and mm. um, so on. I mean, do you think you'd have written it differently if you hadn't been ordained and a Christian? I don't, I, it's a very I mean, it's a question I think is a meaningless one, really, in terms that I, for if I try to answer it, but um, I had li I loved history before I became a historian, before I became a Christian. Mm. Uh, so that I think that uh, I would still have wanted to know a lot of history. Um, if, I'd, if I had become a lawyer as my father wanted, mm. um, I wouldn't have had so much uh, time, of course. Mm. But um, that's an interesting question to me, which I've never confronted before. <laughs> that's interesting too, as an answer, very honest answer. Um, there's so many more things that you did after um, Selwyn. Uh, you went on to be vice chancellor for of Cambridge University for two years. Um, as you said, you don't really know anywhere else, but um, I'm writing a book about Cambridge at the moment and, and trying to work out what it is and what it's meant. Mm. Um, can you help me in any way? Is there anything that I should know about this ancient oh. institution? I mean, it does seem to me that religion is both the heart of it and also a, a special form of religion is the heart of it. I wondered whether you think religion is very important in Cambridge? Well, naturally, I think so, yes. And, uh, I, oh, I think so. I, mean, I, I feel that the signs of it in it are... I'm not sure that... Um, Chapel going, so to speak, is, but uh, wonderful. Way. I believe that Clare uh, Chapel is a wonderfully sort of flourishing place, and um, Trinity Hall has always been, and the Kings, after all, is a, a vastly um, influential in the world, and so is Trinity, so is John's. Um, I'm talking nonsense to you, I think. I mean, I'm talking what is useless. <laughs> it isn't useless um, at all. It's so gen I mean, it's such a general question that it's difficult mm. to say, but I, I've written a book about Japan recently, and Japan is in some ways helpful to, for thinking about Cambridge because somewhere like Kyoto, I don't know if you've been to Japan, but Kyoto is a very religious feeling place. It's full of temples, it's mm. full of monks. Mm, it's a little shrine place. Shrine it? place. And yet, the religion is rather indistinct. Um, if you try and press people on their beliefs, they, they are not very happy to, or they don't know what they are really. Mm -hmm. And certainly interviewing a lot of masters of Cambridge colleges, um, many of them say, well, I presided over St. John's or King's or wherever it was. Of course, I'm not a Christian. Um, I'm an agnostic. Or, but I felt it was important and I was prepared to do it because mm -hmm. I see it is important. Mm. And that's what I like about Cambridge. It seems to combine dignity and reverence without dogma. Yes, right. Yes, yes. It's strong. Mm. It's strong. It's not just woolly. Mm. Yeah. I like that too. Um, but, um, yeah, I. It was awfully interesting being Vice Chancellor. Sixty nine, um, uh, 
was it 69 or 69 to 71. 71. Mm. Rather very difficult period. Huh? It was an interesting mm. period, yes, mm. yes. You had to sort of uh, uh, be very uh, serene. <laughs> <laughs> so it was the time, I mean, for watchers of this, this is the time of the anti Vietnam protests, the students. Yes, yes. The, the, the Americans, uh, I mean, uh, I, I used to analyze lists of protests when they signed mm. papers and <clears throat> who are these people. They were usually a combination of American research students at the top and girls who are freshmen at New Hall <laughs> at the bottom. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, but the American call-up, mm. there was a flight of American students to mm. uh, and made them really very, very revolutionary. But uh, <clears throat> people like our Home Secretary, Mr. Maudling, whom I wholly disapproved of, mm. um, had an idea that the, you know, the Cambridge University of Chantal was shortly going to march on Whitehall. And, um, and, and I can remember, um, did you ever know Michael McCrum as yes. Master of Corpus? Yes, yes. Well, his son, Robert. Mm as an undergraduate, which mm. was a corpus too. Mm. Um, and uh, Robert led a sit-in at the economics building, mm. which is the bottom of our garden, so mm. And after about two hours, um, he was fed up, he was bored. So he walked across our lawn and said he was bored. Could he have a cup of tea? <laughs> 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 and I thought that was... It's so sort of the very opposite dis distance to walking, to marching on Whitehall. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Maudling's theory. <laughs> oh, lovely story. Was this the time of the garden? Uh, I think yes, garden, garden house. Yes, with part of it. Yeah, mm. they, they would protest against the Greek judgment. Greek colonels. Mm. Mm. Did you have to deal with that? Yes, yes, I mm. did. Mm. Do, do that was complicated. Very. Also, it was complicated more because. The judge hmm. uh, was a man called I uh, can't remember. Hmm. Uh, the judge was um, <clears throat> a fool and um, made remarks in Cambridge, like um, made remarks in public, like hmm. uh, the evil influence of the Cambridge Dons. You see, and here was I having to get up in. In public and say they're not, they're, these are jolly good dons. I uh, mm. <laughs> just think there's no evil in us, whatever. Mm. And uh, so then uh, my friends in the law used to write to me saying, Look out, you're going to head, uh, head up the contempt of court, you're not careful. <laughs> <laughs> mm. And then, then, then you went on to um, be Regis Professor for quite yes, a long yes. time. That was, um, that was, I was a tertium quid, you know. Um, uh, some people wanted Geoffrey Elton, who was a very good historian, and some people wanted Jack Plum, who was a very good historian. Mm -hmm. And um, the people who wanted Geoffrey Elton hated Jack Plum, mm -hmm. and the people who wanted Jack Plum hated Geoffrey Elton. So uh, they, um, they hated you slightly less. The pundits, than the vice chancellor and pundits, believed that they had to have a sort of third party. It was no use. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, to uh, then they would mind. Mm. I think they probably did mind. But anyway, I was told by the university I was doing good if I moved from Dixit mm. to Regis, so I, so I did, mm. and enjoyed myself. Mm. You mentioned those two eminent Cambridge historians who I knew a, a little bit. Um, mm. Is there anything more to say about um, either Geoffrey or Jack as historians? I think if I were going to take this question seriously, I should say that although Jeffrey's now probably in the generation which regards him as wrong mm. about the main theories. Mm. About he, Cromwell, you mean? And things. Well, more mm. about Henry VIII, I think, yep. really. Yep. And quite, yeah, yes, like that Cromwell, yes, yes that's certainly. Cromwell. Yep. Um, that uh, probably. Geoffrey was a very powerful researcher into archives. Mm. Uh, and Jack, um, I mean, the fact that he never finished his life of um, Walpole. Walpole, mm. uh, it couldn't have happened with Geoffrey, I think. Mm. Nevertheless, they were both 
good uh, good things to have around. Um, yeah. The other, the other historians, I, I've thought of three, and then I'll stop. It would be nice to hear what you thought. Mm -hmm. One was a, I should declare an interest, he was a dear friend of mine, was Peter Laslett. Did you? Uh, yeah, well, Peter and I were undergraduates together, you see. Were you? And heck, when I was a member of the St. John's College History Society, Peter was the secretary of it. Mm. Uh, he was, so we, we were both fourth year, I think. Mm. Um, and the most brilliant paper we had in our time as undergraduates in that society was by Noel Allen from King's. Good heavens. And Noel <laughs> he came and he, he, he offered us a paper on Admiral Bing. And um, came to a room in John's, I can remember, and we all sat down absolutely thrilled and wrapped by <laughs> Noel on Bing. <laughs> and I remember saying to him afterwards, how did, it was the first time I ever met him. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I remember saying to him afterwards, um, however, you're very learned about Bing, how did you do that? So he said, well, somebody published a book on him yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> like my cheating with the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> how nice. And Peter was, you liked Peter and got on well with him. Yes, yes, though Peter was more eccentric than I was in the sense that uh, uh, it was a bit, a bit, a bit mm. of eccentricity in him, wasn't there? Yes, there was indeed. Oh, yes. Mm. Charming, confused man. Yeah. Um, then um, the second is Hugh Trevoropa, who nearly became my PhD uh, Phil supervisor, and I went to his lectures on Gibbon mm. and Macaulay. You were in Judah, work yes, in Stuart, yeah, work. yeah, that's right. Mm. Yes, and he came here, as you know, to Peter House. Mm. Um, some people liked him very much. Some people liked him less. Did you get on with? I happened to be one of those who got on very well with him. Mm. Mm. 